Welcome everybody to Bedbug TV. I'm your host, Jeff White. And in today's episode, I wanted to answer a question that I do very commonly get. And uh, it is, you know, Jeff, what pesticides do you recommend when you're doing a bedbug treatment? What pesticides do you use? And it's a question I usually avoid by saying, you know, well, it's not so much about the pesticides. Obviously, pesticides are an important part of a bedbug management plan. And, you know, just tell me what you're using. I'll tell you if I think that that's an okay choice. And, you know, it's true, and I do buy into that, but I do want to give some information out there about what Bedbug Central and myself have written into our protocol, why we chose what we chose, and just kind of go over each one quickly and just tell you, you know, a little bit about them. Um, one thing, I, there's a couple things I should say, actually, that I want to say right up front. The first of which is what I just mentioned before, is that I'm not here to sell anybody watching this on a pesticide. You know, there are a lot of pesticides out there, and a lot of them work very similarly to other ones that are comparable to that individual pesticide. And so I'm not here to sell you on one pesticide versus another pesticide and say this one is way better than that one. This is just what we use, and this is why we use it. And, you know, if you choose another product, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the wrong product. And so if you take this information and go to your pest control company and say, you know, well, Jeff White says, you know, he uses this. Why aren't you using that? And they have a reason why. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just, you know, they chose a different pesticide. And it may have the same effects in the end. And so I'm not here to say this is right or wrong. This is just what we use. The other thing I want to mention is that a lot of the pesticides that I'm going to talk about today are really intended to be used by licensed pest control professionals. Now, it's not to say that, you know, your everyday homeowner can't use these things. They're just created by manufacturers that really intend these products to be used by licensed pest control professionals. So, if you watch this and you see this, how I really intend this being used is by industry to know what we're using, and then by homeowners to know what we're using so that they can look at what their company that they've hired is using and see if it's comparable. If you are a homeowner, you watch this and you say, you know what, I'm going to go out and buy those pesticides. In the age of the internet, I actually have access to them when 15 years ago I would have had a hard time finding them, and I'm going to apply them in my house. I can't tell you that that's necessarily illegal, but at the same point, you want to make sure if you do go that route that you do follow the label directions on these very carefully. Again, you know, you're applying something that's really intended to be used by professionals, although not illegal to necessarily be used by other people. You just want to follow those label directions very carefully. Alrighty, so what I want to do is I want to separate these into two different categories. We're going to talk about liquid residual pesticides, which are pesticides you mix into a spray tank and apply in your house using a liquid sprayer, and then dusts. And uh, what we'll do is, in our protocol, we actually alternate two different liquid residuals. And the reason why we do that is we're trying to address any bed bug resistance concerns. If they're resistant to one product, maybe they're not resistant to the other. And it also reduces, you know, the prevalence of resistance, or we hope that it reduces the prevalence of resistance that we see. And so let's first talk about the first product that we use, which is Transport GHP. And why we choose this product versus a lot of other products is because a lot of normal liquid residual products use one active ingredient inside their product. This actually uses two. And those two products are actually in different classes of pesticides. And what that means is that one of the products in here is a synthetic pyrethroid, which is a nerve toxin, and the other one is a neonicotinoid, which works relatively similarly, but not quite the same. That being said, the reason why we choose it is because it has those two active ingredients, which are different classes of pesticides, which may again hope to manage any resistance concerns that are out there. Now, in terms of this individual product, as I said, is Transport GHP, there are really two other products out there that are very similar to this, that use two active ingredients like this, similar products. One of which is also made by the same manufacturer, Transport, which is in a different formulation called Micron. And then there's another one made by a different manufacturer called Temperid. And again, all three of those are relatively similar. And so why we choose Transport GHP is because of how it comes. It comes as a wettable powder. And what that means is there's little powder packs in here. You drop inside your spray tank, you mix with water, you shake it up real good, and that's called a wettable powder formulation. And the reason why we like that or why we choose that is because it's known or it has been known in the past that wettable powders can sometimes offer you more residual activity. It means that they could remain active longer once they're dry. 
And so that's why we choose this. The other two out there are not wettable powders. And uh, that's why we choose Transport GHP. Similar to other products, but it's a wettable powder and we're hoping to get more residual activity. It has two active ingredients inside of it. So again, hoping to manage resistance. And this is what we use on our first service, our third service, our fifth service, our seventh service. Hopefully it doesn't go that long, but that's what we're using. The product that we're alternating with that, so using it on the second service, the fourth service, we use Transport on the first, Demand CS on the second, Transport Demand, Transport Demand. Demand is a synthetic pyrethroid, um, and it comes in a different formulation called a micro-encapsulation. And so what it is, it's again a concentrate you mix with water, and again, this product is showing some of our better results in laboratory studies in regards to the synthetic pyrethroids. Synthetic pyrethroids make up a large portion of what we have available to us today. And so of those, Demand CS is showing some of the better results in regards to lab studies. And it may have to do with the microencapsulation formulation I talked about before, but either way, this is the other product that we're using. And so what we're doing, as I said, is alternating transport, GHP, and demand. And that's what we're using in our liquid residual treatments. Now, in our dust treatments, we're really alternating two different dusts. The first of which is a dust called tri-dye. And what it is, is that it's a aerosolized dust. And it has pyrethrin, PPB, which is a um, synergist, and silica dioxide, or basically silica dust. Now, the reason why we use tri is because, as I said, it's an aerosolized dust. And what that means is you put a little straw on it and you spray it into cracks, which is where we know bed bugs hide. Dust are one of the most important parts of a bed bug management plan. And the reason why we chose the aerosolized one is because it's what we think, I don't want to use the word safer, but more, you know, targeted in its application. When we take a loose dust, which I'm going to talk about in a second, which is just a container of dust we put into a dust bulb and we apply to cracks and crevices, it's very difficult to apply these without having dust become airborne or dust falling out of the crack. And when you're using a dust that has an active ingredient in it, that can be what we consider a misapplication you know, risk, where you may have put dust into a crack, it may later on kind of filter its way out, and then people may have access to that dust. With this aerosolized dust, you spray it into a crack and it actually almost dries or adheres to the surface that it's sprayed upon. And so you can spray this inside cracks and crevices and it will stick to the surface that it's sprayed on inside that crack, basically keeping the dust in that crack. Uh, of course, when you're applying this, you need to be careful of staining because this can stain certain surfaces. It also can remove some finishes on furniture if it's applied incorrectly. But uh, obviously you take those risks into consideration when applying it. And that's why we use tri dye because it is a aerosolized dust that tends to stay in the cracks you apply it to. And from a misapplication perspective, we think it's one of the better options out there. And so that's why we use this. And we know if this does get to the bed bugs, it will end up killing them. It's very, very lethal to bed bugs. The other dust that we use is a loose dust, and it is diatomaceous earth. Now, there's a Bed Bug TV episode on DE, or diatomaceous earth. I recommend you watch that. This is probably the product that we do hear most commonly your everyday homeowner applying on their own. You can get this on the internet very, very easily. Um, it's a, considered a very green pesticide. Again, we recommend that if you purchase it, you follow the label directions. And remember that even though it's green, it's still a pesticide, and it still needs to be applied consistently with its label. Now, the reason that we use it from a pest control perspective is, is the risk I talked about before. You know, we know that dust is one of the most effective products that we have for bed bugs. And there's a lot of dusts out there that actually have an active ingredient incorporated into the dust. So the synthetic pyrethroids that I talked about before may be incorporated right into these dusts. tri that I talked about before has pyrethrin in it, which is a more traditional active ingredient. And these dusts can as well. But our concern is that, you know, when you're applying loose dusts, again, it's very hard to apply them without having some of that dust become airborne or back out of that crack. It can be done, but it's difficult. And so we choose diatomaceous earth due to the label, due to the fact that it is considered a low toxicity pesticide, a very green pesticide, and we can go in and apply it, even though it may not be as effective as those other dusts, with less risk as opposed to misapplication. And so when we go in and apply this, you know, obviously we would never want to misapply it. We would never want it to become airborne. We would never want it to fall out of a crack. But if God forbid that it does, it's considered a very green, very low toxicity pesticide. And so it offers us a little bit more comfort in regards to that misapplication concern. 
And that's why we use diatomaceous earth. We know it can be effective. We know it can kill bugs. Um, it may not be as effective as some of those other dusts out there that have active ingredients in them, but it offers what we define as a lower risk in regards to the misapplication of these products. And so those are the four pesticides primarily that we're using. We're incorporating some other ones in here and there, but those are the four main ones. And again, remember, they're more intended to be used by pest control professionals that are licensed. That being said, if you're an everyday homeowner and you do go online and you do want to purchase these pesticides for use, we just caution you very carefully to read the labels and follow the label directions. It's extremely important. Um, these are active ingredient pesticides that could potentially you know, be toxic if misapplied or used incorrectly with the label. Um, and that's kind of the overview of the pesticides that we're using. Uh, again, just because your company's not using them doesn't mean that they're wrong. You know, this is just what we're using. And, you know, if you have any questions about this, please email me, jeff.white at bedbugcentral.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions because this may be a topic people have questions about. And uh, I hope to see everybody soon enough.